Welcome to this um, event. It's my privilege to uh, introduce Michael Rakowitz to you. But before I do so, I want to thank several centers and departments at UMDC for supporting this event. Um, the Drescher Center for the Humanities is the primary sponsor for, of this event. And I want to particularly thank Jessica Berman, who's sitting up here in front, who's the director of the center, for her generous support and her valuable time that she devoted to making this event possible. Also, Natalia Panfile of the Drescher Center is the one responsible for all of the communication. She's hiding there, <laughs> you know, playing her role for all the communication and organization. And so she too deserves a very special thanks from us. Um, the center is also sponsored by the Department of Visual Arts the Center for Innovation, Research, and Creativity in the Arts, known as CIRCA, the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture, the CADBC, the American Studies Department, the Modern Languages and Linguistics and Inter uh, Intercultural Communications Department. Um, there's another event uh, of uh, the Drescher Center, sponsored by the Drescher Center on Wednesday, March 11th. It's uh, titled, The Narrative of an Undocumented Immigrant Woman in the US. It's the Joan S. Coroman Lecture, and it's um, given by Maria Gabriel Pacheco, who is an immigrant rights activist. So again, it's on Wednesday, March 11th, at 4 p.m. in the library gallery. So, uh, and before I forget, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Now, about our guest. We are so thrilled to host Michael Rakowitz at UMBC. Michael is a professor of art theory and practice at Northwestern University. He produces work in a wide ranging international context from Ramallah, Iraq, to Budapest, Hungary, to Chicago, New York, Boston, and Baltimore. Likewise, his artwork is in public collections that include the MoMA, New York, uh, the Smart Museum of Art, Chicago, the British Museum, the Kabul Museum in Afghanistan, uh, the Architecture and Design Collection of UNESCO in Paris, uh, the Neue, Ga Neue Gallery in Kassel, Germany, the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, Netherlands. Uh, Michael is also in ex exhibited internationally, including at the Tate Modern in London, the MoMA PSI, the Mass MoCA in um, um, in Massachusetts, uh, the, um, uh, the Castello di Rivioli, uh, the 10th Istanbul Biennial, the Sharjah Biennial, um, the Transmedial, there's a whole bunch, I just chose a few. Um, his um, public project, Return, was presented by Creative Time in New York. And in 2012, he showed at Documenta 13, currently the most prestigious international exhibition of contemporary art that's held every five years in Kassel, Germany. Michael has also received several awards for his art, including the 2012 Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Award, as well as the 2002 Design 21 Grand Prix from uh, the UNESCO. Um, Michael Rakowitz's work is confrontational, but his methods are collaborative. He uses age-old methods of food and storytelling to spark engaged conversations about subjects that we tiptoe around. He captures our attention by catching us off guard. For example, when through a process of meticulous research, he creates surprising parallels between Darth Vader and Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Urban space, urban situations, popular culture and geopolitics, iconoclasm and the large scale destruction of cultural objects and heritage sites, these are some of the themes in Michael Rakowitz's work. Thank you and please help me to welcome Michael. Tremenda, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here at UMBC and to be back in Baltimore after eight years. Um, and I've seen some ghosts that I enjoy seeing, um, you know, being back here. And I also want to thank 
uh, Jessica Berman and Natalia Panfile, not only for inviting me, but also being so persistent um, as I'm a notoriously bad correspondent on email. Um, this is also an apology. <laughs> um, and I want to thank Lisa Morin and also you, Perminda Jacob, for inviting me last year. Um, and it's nice to be able to make good on that invitation this year. Um, with that, I'll just get into it as we have limited time together. Um, it's also been really, really wonderful meeting with the students today and an incredibly inspiring day. So I want to thank them for inviting me into their studios. I know what an intimate and vulnerable space that can be. And uh, I feel very, very honored. So thank you. In 2008, I spent a great deal of time in Redfern, a largely Aboriginal neighborhood in Sydney, Australia producing a project that involved indigenous citizens and organizations from that community for the Biennale. I was struck by the overt racism in the city, the ongoing crimes against and the displacement of native Australians now 248 years running. But there was something done as protocol that I felt kept the problems and failures visible and made them present, something I've tried to do in my own work for the past decade. In Australia, the acknowledgement of country is usually a statement or a speech made by an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal to show respect to the traditional custodians of the land. I've often believed that the best way to forget someone important is to name a building after them. So their name disappears into an address, into the architecture. I'm sure that similar things have been said about the acknowledgement of country, but as an outsider, I was incredibly moved when I heard this preamble spoken at every public speech. I thought about my own context as an American living on indigenous land taken from its original inhabitants. To live up to my commitment to the citizens of Redfern, I made a promise to myself that I would continue to remind those who had forgotten. Since my return to the US, I've begun all my public lectures with this, an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to the elders, both past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and hopes of Native America. We must always remember that under the concrete and asphalt, this land is, was, and always will be traditional indigenous land. So a little bit about me. I'm from Great Neck, Long Island. Um, this is a notoriously affluent hamlet in New York's uh, Long Island. And, um, and so, yeah, why, why Great Neck? Um, this is an early advertisement for living out there. My grandparents, when they fled Iraq in 1946, um, were told when they landed in New York that a good place to buy a house, and uh, this was a Syrian man telling my grandfather, a good place to buy a house would be in Port Washington, Long Island. Um, my grandfather took the train line that goes out to Port Washington, which in uh, terms of uh, New York's uh, the Long Island Railroad is the red line. And so my grandfather got on the train and he fell asleep. Um, he panicked, thinking that he had missed his stop, not knowing that Port Washington was the final destination, got out in Great Neck and bought a house. <laughs> And this is why all the Iraqi Jews moved to Great Neck. <laughs> and then they all moved away when the Iranian Jews moved in 1979. So these are the images of the houses that I grew up looking at, very, very posh uh, Victorian style houses. Um, and then this is Six Gateway Drive in Great Neck. Um, this is the former residence of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, who started writing The Great Gatsby when he was in Great Neck. So Great Neck was supposed to be West Egg, whereas Roslyn, Manhasset, and Sands Point were supposed to be East Egg. This is Andy Kaufman reading The Great Gatsby from cover to cover as one of his public uh, sort of uh, stand-up uh, performance art or uncomfortable performances um, that uh, I grew up loving. Uh, he was also from Great Neck. My mother would point him out during Rosh Hashanah services at our local synagogue and say, that's the guy who makes you laugh so much. That's the guy who lip syncs Mighty Mouse. 
This is a house that you can buy right now in Kings Point, um, which is the most affluent part of Great Neck. And then this is that same house juxtaposed with one of Saddam Hussein's palaces in Baghdad. So that's all you need to know about me. So I want to start by showing some images of an emptied out museum from April of 2003. These are images of the Iraq Museum after the looting. In September 2006, I was in Berlin for an exhibition, and as part of my time there, I visited the Pergamon Museum. Um, I knew that the Pergamon Museum was notorious for housing the Pergamon altar and the Pergamon friezes, which were, of course, a contested um, acquisition of cultural patrimony from uh, Turkey. Um, what I didn't know was that it also housed the Ishtar Gate, which was excavated in what is now modern-day Iraq, um, from 1899 until 1914 by a German archaeologist named Robert Koldeway. The, brick, uh, the, the gate was brought uh, back to Germany brick by brick, um, and any, any uh, missing bricks were reconstructed by the museum staff to recreate the grandeur of the original. Um, the Ishtar Gate was the main feature of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. It was built in 575 BC or around there. And it was um, through the Ishtar Gate that Babylonians would pass through the main processional way that was used only on New Year's celebrations in ancient Babylon. Um, the people and the priests would carry statues to and from the Akitu Temple in the north, and the name of this avenue was Ajibor Shapu, which translated from the ancient Babylonian means the invisible enemy should not exist. It's the coolest name of a street that I've ever heard, kind of like a Jenny Holzer truism. Um, and it's also the title of this project. This is the Ishtar Gate as it stands today in Iraq. Um, it is a reconstruction that was commissioned by the Iraqi government in the 1950s, uh, made out of plaster, plywood, and two by fours, and was meant to stand as the entrance to a museum which was never completed. It became one of the most famous sites for photo opportunities for American soldiers stationed in Iraq. And um, in, that, in 2007, if you looked up Google Images and put in Ishtar Gate, this was the first image that came up. So you can see that it was popular for the soldiers. So as part of this project, there's a series of drawings that more or less tell you the information and the stories that I've just presented. And as I started to think about looting, um, it became important to think about this not only as something that began historically with um, the, uh, not, not, not just the, uh, the, the establishment of the Imperial Museums in the 1800s, uh, but also um, with a kind of larger tradition of iconoclasm and um, cultural theft. Um, during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, President Saddam Hussein began a massive reconstruction project atop the partially excavated ruins of Babylon. Despite the protests of archaeologists, the project was expansive. It included a recreation of the Temple of Nebuchadnezzar with bricks bearing the inscription, this was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, to glorify Iraq. In 2003, U.S. Marines established a base on the site and built a helipad close to the ruins. Iraqi archaeologists complained that military vehicles were crushing the bricks of ancient structures, the wind from helicopters blasting ancient walls. Coalition forces agreed to close the base in 2004, but it was not closed until 2007. The National Museum of Iraq is, uh, is known for housing one of the world's great collections of ancient artifacts including the Warqa vase of Uruk from the fourth millennium BC, 
Thousands of ancient stone cylinder seals, monumental Assyrian reliefs from the royal palaces from the first millennium BC, and a vast collection of inscribed clay tablets that are amongst the earliest examples of writing ever found. The Iraq Museum was pillaged from April 10 to April 12 in 2003, shortly after the fall of Baghdad. Display cases were emptied, dropped artifact, artifacts were damaged, and storage vaults were robbed. Many missing items have since been recovered through international policing and amnesty for looters. Each returned object is photographed on a long wooden table among all other recuperated goods, the resulting photos serving as a visual archive. Fakes, as well as reproductions sold in the museum's gift shop have also been brought back. Dr. Donnie George served as president of the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and director general of the National Museum in Baghdad. In the aftermath of the museum's looting, he worked tirelessly to help recover some 50% of missing items. However, because the museum continues to be a soft target for insurgents, international policing agencies from Kuwait and Iran to Japan and the US are for now retaining any confiscated museum objects. Under Saddam Hussein, Dr. George took part directly in archaeological excavations in order to avo avoid Ba'ath Party meetings. And this is where I started to become really interested in his character. In order for Dr. George to hold the position he held in the museum and also through the, the State Board of Antiquities, he had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. He was an Assyrian Christian, and nobody would have held that high a position without being a member of the party. And these were ideologies that he clearly had disagreed with. And in order to evade the meetings, he started to more or less telegraph from these excavation sites, something the director of a museum never does, is participate directly in the excavation. And so he would telegraph in and say, sorry, we just found something amazing in Iskandaria. Um, can't be at the meeting. So he's circumventing authority, which is something I like. Dr. George also sidelined as a drummer in a band called 99%, short for 99% of excellence, that specialized in covers of Deep Purple and Pink Floyd songs. Now, this is where I really fell in love with him. <laughs> Deep Purple Smoke on the Water recalls a disastrous fire during a 1971 Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention concert at a casino in Montreux, Switzerland. A fan shot a flare gun inside the venue. A fire ensued, and the entire building was destroyed. Members of Deep Purple watched the events unfold across Lake Geneva in a mobile studio on loan from the Rolling Stones. After receiving a letter with a bullet enclosed from extremists who threatened to harm his family if a ransom was not paid, Dr. George resigned his post, fleeing to Syria in August 2006. In December 2006, Dr. George arrived with his family in the United States, having accepted a position as a visiting professor in the Department of Anthropology at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Ahlan was Sahan, Dr. George. So the drawings are set up um, pretty routinely. The, um, the drawings themselves evoke not only the storyboard drawings of, say, uh, somebody planning a movie, but also the diaristic drawings that archaeologists make when they're on site. And the center of the exhibition is the sort of critical moment of the work, which is this ongoing commitment to reconstruct um, all of the artifacts that are listed on Interpol and the Oriental Institute's database as having the status of missing, stolen, destroyed, or unknown. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. So the artifacts are reconstructed to scale using these databases and gives you an idea of the way that this works. And the materials that are enlisted to make the artifacts are actually the food wrappers of Middle Eastern foodstuffs and the Arabic English newspapers that are given away for free in this country where there is an Arab population. So it's essentially all these fragments of cultural visibility here that are being enlisted to make these things that are, for all intents and purposes now, invisible. So it's another kind of archaeology of looking down at the ground. It's an archaeology of detritus. And detritus is often also archaeology, as long as there's thousands of years separating us and trash.
And this gives you an idea of the, um, the wooden table that was used for those photographs. And so, you know, this uh, sort of quotation of that same thing is used with that wooden table that serves as the uh, support for the artifacts. Um, the database that I use is the Lost Treasures from Iraq um, website, which was uh, uh, which the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago went live with in the aftermath of the looting. Um, the reason for their going live with this was twofold. One was to deter any people who were potentially buying artifacts on the black market to do a kind of comparison. That if they were offered something by simply clicking on the Iraq Museum number, um, you would be able to bring up photos and compare side by side. So it was a little bit like uh, missing children photos on the backs of milk cartons in the 1980s that we had in this country. The other reason was to educate the world on how much human cultural patrimony had just potentially been wiped off the face of the earth. Um, and so I, along with a team of assistants that over the past um, eight years has now comprised of about 25 different young artists in Chicago, have been reconstructing these, um, these artifacts uh, to scale. And so you can see here that it provides you the Iraq M Museum number, the provenance, the dimensions, um, and then also the material, which makes a, uh, a sculptor's job um, pretty easy, especially when you consider that it shows the artifact from all different sides as well. And so a final sort of like moment where something gets covered or replaced or reconstructed in this uh, project is, um, is the soundtrack. And so the ambient soundtrack when listening to this, uh, when, when seeing this exhibition is actually um, a version of Smoke on the Water that I commissioned by an Arabic band called Ayub, which is based in uh, Brooklyn, uh, where, the music, where the instruments are replaced, not with, uh, uh, with um, saz and bazook and, uh, and all other kinds of um, uh, instruments that are from uh, Iraq. So I'll play you a little snippet of that. So you get the idea. Instead of the Richie Blackmore guitar solo, you have this uh, bazook solo by Taufik Ben Amor, and the whole thing just kind of like collapses into more um, uh, crazy ruination. Um, this is the work um, displayed in the Sharjah Biennial in 2007, and um, this particular context, unbeknownst to me, Dr. George shared with me that the UAE was actually one of the um, countries that was complicit in the trafficking of these illegally uh, looted, not that anything is actually ever legally looted, but these uh, looted artifacts. Um, 
And so uh, it was a way for this kind of museum that um, doesn't exist and exists in this kind of precarious place interrupting the Sharjah Art Museum. And so the artifacts are presented as they would be in a museum with um, accession cards. And instead of it just simply being the facts of the, um, the object, about the object, it um, includes all the pertinent information like the numbers of the excavation and the museum um, number, and then also a small description, but instead of it elaborating more on its use, um, it's been replaced with the fragments of conversations from different people reacting or speaking about the looting. So in this case, um, the war had the single positive result of awakening international interest in Mesopotamian culture from Fiorella Strick, Stricka to um, Satan's favorite poet, Donald Rumsfeld, who had this to say about this vase. Let me say one other thing. The images you are seeing on television, you are seeing over and over and over. And it's the same picture of some person walking out of some building with a vase. And you see it 20 times, and you think, my goodness, were there that many vases? Is it possible there were that many vases in the whole country? Um, to someone like Donnie George, who was able to kind of provide information that doesn't normally surface about um, why these things were stolen and it, you know that there were more than one reason. Um, this piece has a very nice story. It was taken by two young men during the looting. They took nine very nice pieces to their houses. They came to us after the looting and they said, don't ask for our names or addresses. We were in the museum at the time of the looting. We felt very sorry because we could not stop anything. Then they decided they would take things and bring them back when it was safe, and they did it. As soon as we had the American soldiers protecting the museum, they brought back the nine pieces. And so um, this exhibition went up in January of 2007. As I mentioned, in, in uh, December of 2006, Dr. George arrived in the United States with his family after fleeing Iraq. And so I started to worry that here was this man who was running for his life and he's coming to New York and there's this weird artist doing this show you know, about him. Um, and I had this opportunity to meet him um, at this event where a lot of scholars were giving him books about archaeology because he had to leave his behind in Iraq. Um, and he had heard about the exhibition, but the thing he was most fascinated with um, was the drawing of him playing the drums. And he knew about this because the art newspaper, which had followed his crisis from the beginning, um, had released their, their current issue with the headline, Revealed Donnie George Rockstar. And so he asked me, you know, like, there's no YouTube videos of 99%. There's no MP3s. There's no pictures. How did I get a picture of him playing the drums? And so I told him, that I took a picture of him looking kind of bored at a meeting offline, and then a picture of this guy, and then through the magic of Photoshop came up with this composite image. And so he smiled and said, that's archaeology too. <laughs> and so I was in Chicago uh, when these photos were taken, but um, the gallery in New York contacted me and said that uh, Donnie had come to see the exhibition and that he had stationed himself the entire day he was there and he was giving people tours of the artifacts the way that he would have done in his own museum in Iraq. When I spoke with Donnie about this, he said that um, he became incredibly emotional when looking at the artifacts and I asked him why it was and he said this was as close to the artifacts that he ever expected to get again. It ends up being incredibly sad for me because in March of 2011, Dr. George passed away. So like a lot of the artifacts, he ended up cradled in this kind of third party country, unable to go back because it was too dangerous. So with some of the similar concerns, I was invited to participate in the Documenta exhibition of Carolyn Krista Bakarjiev in 2012. And Documenta has um, a history um, that's rooted in 1955. And uh, Arnold Boda, when he put on the first Documenta that year, had wondered what uh, role culture could play in the reconstruction of Germany. And if you look at those first, those first uh, images from the first 
Documenta, you'll see that the Ark was displayed in front of the ruins of the Orangerie. And that um, castle was 90% destroyed because it was uh, the place where Henschel had their, um, had their, uh, their, their factories and were making the panzer tanks. And, um, and so Carolyn was one day checking emails on her Blackberry and responding to one. And she was trying to write the, the name Kassel. And her Blackberry did autocorrect and wrote Kabul. And so she started to wonder if Arnold Boda was trying to raise the stakes of what culture could do to reconstruct Germany. What can culture do in a place that's still under siege? So the entire Afghanistan position of Documenta in 2012 was based on autocorrect from Blackberry. Um, but it's a beautiful, almost biblical story from above. Um, when the Bamiyan Buddhas were destroyed in 2001, um, I was immediately shaken you know, into what I would call probably my current uh, condition. Um, for those of you who don't remember the events, um, this was what we saw on television of these sixth century Buddhas that were hundreds of feet tall carved into the cliff side of the Hazarat, Hazar, uh, Hazarat region of um, Afghanistan in Bamiyan. And um, I was educated as a stone carver um, when I was uh, 15 years old. And uh, the first examples of um, stone carving that I was presented by my, uh, by my teacher were the examples of Michelangelo's unfinished Prigioni which showed the contrast between rough hewn stone and highly polished stone and illustrated perfectly what Michelangelo always said that he was simply liberating the figure from the stone. Um, the treasury building in Petra, Jordan, uh, carved into the side of sandstone cliffs, and then the Bamiyan Buddhas. And so here I am, age 15, young and beautiful. Um, and you can see that the maquette in the background, my first stone carving was actually a tribute to the Bamiyan Buddhas. And so there was a primal scene located in my education as an artist, and it was as if my own art history had collapsed along with the Bamiyan Buddhas. And I wasn't foolish enough to think that I could reconstruct the Bamiyan Buddhas using paper mache as I had done with the Iraqi artifacts, nor did I think that I was the one to do that. Um, when I started to engage in the conversation about reconstruction, it turned out the International Commission on Monuments and Sites and UNESCO had determined that the Bamiyan Buddhas could not and should not be reconstructed. When I visited Bamiyan, I received an entirely different story from everybody living there. And that the Hazara minority who lived there, um, who were not Buddhist, but were Muslim, regarded them as sacred and part of their landscape and wanted to reconstruct them. And here they were not able to speak for themselves or their own desires. So I, thought, I, I just thought, fuck it. I'm going to teach them how to rebuild the Bamiyan Buddhas. And if they want to, they can do it. So stone carving actually existed in the Hazara region of, um, of uh, Afghanistan in the Bamiyan Valley for thousands of years and up until 200 years ago it was pretty active and hasn't um, resurfaced. So as part of my project in Afghanistan I thought it would be really poetic and meaningful to teach um, a stone carving workshop um, with Bert Praxenthaler who was um, the chief uh, restorer and custodian of the Bamiyan Buddha remnants in um, Bamiyan and Abbas al Adad, who was an Afghani stone carver who had been pursued by the Taliban because he was creating realistic stone carver carvings. And so um, 12 students who were local, who were between age 16 and 22, um, signed up for the uh, stone carving workshop. None of them were art majors. Um, some of them were studying agriculture. Some of them were still in high school. Some of them hospitality and tourism. And so inside a cave that was located just up here at the top of where one of the Bamiyan Buddhas um, stood, uh, we would hike up there every day 
uh, for about 10 minutes and, um, and carve in this old monastery cave um, where many of these kids' uh, parents had been executed by, um, by the Taliban. I found this out afterwards. Um, but of course, when people turn their guns on the artwork, the people aren't far behind. And so I'll play a little bit of the sound that started to echo in that cave. Um, we had six men, six women, um, and the man that you see here is Abbas al Abdad, who um, had come about three days into the workshop. And the way that the workshop happened was the students, I gave them a lecture on stone carving, which is the same lecture that I give to my students at Northwestern University that brings them from prehistory up through conceptual art, you know, including um, contemporary artists like Maurizio Catalan and Wolfgang Lehm, you know, who have used stone carving. So the students were really captivated by modernism and by the contemporary. And it was um, midway through uh, the third day. And so this is just an example of some of the things I showed them. I showed them Henry Moore's sculptures. And I explained that Henry Moore was often saying that he was making the sculptures for his sheep on his estate. And the students were like, oh, we have sheep, you know? <laughs> we also have oxen, you know? So we can do sculptures for both. Um, and then this is Wolfgang Leib's milkstone, uh, where he carves a very slight divot uh, into a slab of marble and um, puts milk on top of it so you can't tell what's marble and what's milk. Um, and then I showed them Bryce Canyon, and I showed the way that the wind carves the stone as well over thousands of years. So you can have a thousand year durational sculpture that's made by the wind um, and showed them the way that these hoodoos are actually made and that a lot of these things get named after the fact. So if you go to Bryce Canyon, you get a little brochure of what some people have named the hoodoos. And so this one is Queen Victoria, kind of looks like her. <laughs> um, but about three days into the exhibition, or into the workshop, Abbas al Adad came in and stopped the students. One of them was actually blowing on his stone for three days, thinking that he would blow a hole through the, uh, the stone, and it was beautiful because conceptual art was alive and well in Bamiyan. And he quickly had them start shifting gears and he started to carve women in um, hijab and um, you know, the Bamiyan Buddhas and, and all these other um, realistic uh, responses to the landscape and their current condition. And so he came up to me afterwards and he said, um, you know, in Afghanistan, there's plenty of abstraction and obfuscation. It's the real that's radical. And when I thought about his role as this realistic sculptor, you know, who was making heroes of the resistance against the Taliban, making monuments to the heroes of the resistance, this immediately, you know, I felt like was a liberatory moment of the project where um, suddenly my appearance as this person from the outside uh, was um, deeply enhanced by a teacher who um, really understood the way that the work happens contextually there. And the really great thing about this is that shortly after this workshop, Abbas al Adad opened up an atelier in Bamiyan, and a lot of these students have continued under his tutelage. So they gave up their agriculture majors and their hospitality majors, and I don't know what the parental response was to that. Um, this contrasts with the way that the work that I did in Kassel um, related to my experience in Bamiyan. These are pictures of the Frigidianium, and um, as the main venue of Documenta, this is actually one of um, the oldest public libraries and museums in Europe. And so this is the way that the library looked after um, 1930, I think it's 1938, when it was finally Nazified. You can see the, um, the swastika. And it has a pretty glorious history where the Brothers Grimm were actually the first librarians. Um, and uh, in 1941, in September of 1941, about 60 to 70 British bombs actually um, hit the Frigidianum, burning whatever was remaining of the collection that wasn't already burned by the Nazis in 1941 when they had their book burning um, event or rally 
in front of the Frigidsianum. So um, actually 1939, I'm sorry. So the book burning happened in 39 and the, um, the bombing by the British in 41. And so when I saw these images in, um, in Kassel during my research trip, I immediately of course thought of similar images from the Iraq Museum. But I was struck when I saw SS soldiers participating in these bucket brigades with school children to save the books from the, muse from, from the burning building. So these same soldiers who may have been participating in that rally of getting rid of literature that was deemed um, degenerate or not aligned with the Nazi um, party's ideology, um, that they were looking to save whatever remained. And so this is sort of what you're left with. And much, many of the books were um, made out of parchment, so they ended up burning like um, human skin. And that's an image of the Brothers Grimm. And it's like an instant Artapovera piece with the books around them. And then I was very struck by this. This is the Halskos. Um, in German, this means the neck brace. And this is a book of prayers that was, um, was too damaged to repair. And it serves as a kind of admin, admonishment um, of Germany in, um, in the past. And so when I saw this and I saw the way that it had turned into this color, um, that the, the parchment burned indeed like a body might have, um, it occurred to me that these books had petrified, that somehow they had become so scared and so traumatized that they had turned to stone to preserve themselves. And in this moment of a kind of hallucinatory uh, connection with the object and feeling the object as, um, as, as, an, as a, an entity that had agency that felt trauma, I decided that, um, that stone carving was the way of speaking back to this. So Abbas al-Adad had actually helped me harvest um, the travertine in the Bamiyan Hills, the same hills where the Bamiyan Buddhas were made. And using stone carving techniques, we reconstructed the, 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 the ruins. Um, now, Abbas al-Adad, as we know, is hunted by the Taliban. And a lot of these books were actually books of prayer. And some of them actually had crosses on them. Some of them had faces of Jesus and other um, apostles. And for an Afghani to, to carve those, those visages and those symbols, it would be a death sentence. So he was able to carve the books to a certain point. But then they had to be airlifted out of Afghanistan by the German army, and then brought to the most Catholic stone carving country in the world, Italy. So it had all these moments of a kind of provenance. It sounds a little bit like a joke of an Iraqi Jewish artist and Afghani uh, stone carvers and uh, militant uh, extremists who blow it up and then Catholic stone carvers. Um, and so this is the way it was displayed in the Frigidsianum where these book collections had existed and then displayed along with descriptions about what these books were. In one of the vitrines, the city of Kassel had loaned me um, some manuscripts that were deemed uh, too unimportant to restore. And so it made me realize that not every death is a celebrity death. And then in some of the vitrines were the actual remnants of the Bamiyan Buddhas and shards that came from it that are being studied by the Technical University of Munich. And then um, Bert Praxenthaler gave me his collection of exploded shells that were found at the base of the Buddhas, which he regarded as Taliban ready-mades. And so there, these are the fragments of the Buddha. And then there were all these quotes from Mala Muhammad Omar, which I found fascinating, responding to these accusations of iconoclasm. And as the world was outraged with the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas, he made a comment, we are only breaking stones. And perhaps less uh, 
concise was his other quote, which was that he did not want to destroy the Bamiyan Buddha. In fact, some foreigners came to me and said they would like to conduct repair work on the Bamiyan Buddha that had been slightly damaged by rains. This shocked me. I thought, these callous people have no um, concern for the thousands of Afghan human beings, women and children who are starving, um, but they care so much about inanimate objects like the Bamiyan Buddhas. This was extremely deplorable. That is why I ordered its destruction. Had they come for humanitarian work, I would have never destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas. And so in this case, it's um, this kind of really interesting rebuttal against this Western gaze looking east eastward and speaking about cultural heritage as a kind of shield. And so um, I brought that into the fray as a kind of uncomfortable rebuttal to the West. And in another vitrine um, were examples of cuneiform, um, early examples of writing from Babylon. And then um, when I realized why cuneiform had actually been preserved, it was because a lot of the libraries that held it and a lot of the storages that held it um, had been burned by marauding armies advancing on ancient Babylon and later by the Mongols in the 13th century. So it was fire that preserved the first examples of writing. And then, of course, fire ends up destroying more recent ones. So I know we only have about 10 minutes left. And so I wanted to show this one last piece. Um, on April 9th, 2003, the day before the looting of the Iraq Museum began, Saddam's statue in Ferdo Square was pulled down. And it was in the aftermath of the destruction of the statue that I started to see the symbols of power dispersed um, throughout Iraq. In this case, a man from Kurna is standing on top of the, the sort of uh, exposed root of one of the sculptures, assuming the, the pose that Saddam Hussein had in the sculpture before it had come down. Um, this is an Iraqi man um, looting Saddam Hussein's palace um, during the shock and awe campaign. Those plates ended up being used by ordinary Iraqis as their, um, as their everyday dishes, along with chandeliers and comfortable couches. I'm sure you all remember some of these images. Um, and so in looking at all this, I started to wonder what are the artifacts that people aren't looking to retain? You know, eBay was one of the first places where artifacts had shown up for sale after the looting of the museum. And so I started to look at eBay the same way that I look at Google. It's basically a search engine for me. And so I started to find that you could buy Saddam Hussein's silverware, his Christoffel silverware, on eBay. And these were the things that were not being retained. And so, um, Creative Time approached me in 2011 to do a small project with um, a high-end New York City restaurant called Park Avenue. So Marina Abramovich did one seasonal menu in winter 2011, then Janine Antoni, then Paul Ramirez Jonas, and so I was charged with doing the fall. Um, in, um, an earlier work, which I won't be able to describe today, investigated the provenance of Iraqi date syrup. And Iraqi date syrup is um, something that comes from the over 600, diff 600 different varieties of, of dates that grow in Iraq and are largely considered to be the best in the world. Date syrup, if you buy it um, that is not Israeli, um, will usually say product of Lebanon um, or product of Syria. But date palms don't grow in Lebanon. And um, it turns out that Iraqi companies put the syrup into large plastic vats in the Iraqi capital. It's driven over the border into Syria where it gets put into an unmarked aluminum can, then driven over the border into Lebanon where it gets labeled as product of Lebanon, and then it's shipped to the rest of the world. And this was one of the ways that Iraqi companies had circumvented the UN sanctions that were in place from 1990 until 2003. So still in 2004 and 2006 and 2011, this practice was still followed and it turned out that it was because no importing companies could sustain the charges that Homeland Security would surely 
um, hit them with if they had something that was listed as product of Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, because it would necessitate a full scan of the shipping container that came in and they usually get charged about $5,000 for this. So I told the restaurant um, and I told the chef, like, you have a menu that basically tells you, tells diners where their arugula comes from and you tell us what cow our meat came from and uh, it becomes a way of telling the diner, um, you know, making the diner feel good and I wanted to make the diner feel bad. And so I said, I want you to use Iraqi date syrup and I want you to say it's from Iraq. And so he said, done. Uh, what do Iraqis make with date syrup? And I said, well, there's a very famous dessert called Debas Warashi, which is date syrup that's mixed with tahini. And uh, you dip bread in it. It's dessert. It's delicious. It's like a liquefied halva. And, um, and he said, OK, great. I'm going to serve Debas Warashi on the plate. And then I'm going to have venison on top of it. So it's like the American deer hunt meets the Iraqi date harvest. And so I said, fantastic. <laughs> and so I said, and here's, here's, the, here's the twist. Uh, it's going to be served on the plates that were looted from Saddam Hussein's palaces that you can buy on eBay. And this was a conference call, so it was dead silence. <laughs> and then finally, the person from the PR department speaks up and says, I think we're going to get a lot of attention for this project. <laughs> and, and so I said, perfect. <laughs> So this is how it looked. This is the American deer hunt meets the Iraqi date harvest. And so um, the two sources that were selling this on eBay was an American soldier who was stationed in Iraq who was able to purchase these on flea markets that are actually vetted by uh, the sort of commanding forward bases. And then an Iraqi refugee living in Michigan whose father was a high-ranking officer in the Republican Guard. And so this is me and the chef. And then this is the seal on Saddam Hussein's hospitality plates. It turned out Saddam was also a looter, that he had actually um, the plates of the former Iraqi King Faisal II, who was killed in 1958. Saddam was completely infatuated with the history of the former Iraqi monarch. And so they found these in his, um, in his cupboard. And they were a gift from Queen Elizabeth of England. And it's made from Wedgwood, China. And then these are two Kuwaitis eating off of Saddam's uh, plates at the restaurant. And so this is kind of how my work gets reviewed these days. This is the New York Post in their brilliant headline, Saddam does the dishes. And so um, about two days before the project was about to end, I received a cease and desist letter from the State Department. Um, Hillary Clinton was actually CC'd, demanding the surrender of the Iraqi plates belonging to Saddam Hussein. So even the inanimate objects had to surrender to the United States. So this is a copy of the cease and desist letter. Um, and uh, I just uh, more or less said, done, perfect. This is a beautiful ending. When I think about the Iraqi artifacts that are turned over to the Iraqi government, um, uh, after they're being held in these other countries, they're given over in these repatriation ceremonies. And so I said, I, all I want is to be there to film the repatriation ceremony. And they said, no problem. Um, but they forgot to call me. So I happened to be in New York visiting family when all of a sudden I got a phone call from Ann Pasternak at Creative Time asking me where I was. And I told her I was in New York, and she said, the handoff is happening tomorrow. I don't know why it has to be tomorrow, but it's happening tomorrow. It's like Tuesday, December 12th, I think, 2011. And so um, I arrived at Creative Times offices, and then these two officers from the um, State Department's uh, uh, Office of Forfeiture and Assets um, showed up and verified that, yes, these are indeed the plates that were given by the Queen Elizabeth to King Faisal. And they more or less told us, like, you know, it's very, very interesting. You don't have fakes. We expected these might be fake. And so I'm going to play some snippets of this, um, of what happened that day. In this way, I think the project follows through with a lot of the traces that I was interested in, in terms of where the object went, where it belongs, um, the history that's loaded uh, inside of it. 
I'm somebody who doesn't believe in the destruction of monuments and in the tearing down of symbols of power that people uh, may have resisted or may have resented. Uh, I think that's part of the place's history. And I think that when those symbols are erased, you're dealing with um, an unhealthy amnesia that countries and people tend to um, fall into. I'm going to drop them off right now with the, uh, to the Iraqi uh, embassy. Embassy to the uh, Iraqi mission. Oh, wow. Two so many with the Iraqi with the Iraqi Bush. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with Obama. Obama. <laughs> yeah, Bush. You know, he was hoping to bring them back on his uh, trip back. Wow. So I don't know if it's going to happen that quick or not, but that's why they wanted to that's do it today. That's why they wanted it to, to wow. Yeah. yeah, it came all the way from uh, D.C. to request to get this done today. I was a little bit surprised that the Iraq mission to the UN would want back the symbols that the US and many of the people in Iraq had seemed so eager to uh, dispel and to destroy. <laughs> the address of the Iraq mission to the UN is 14 East 79th Street. <laughs> We're standing in front of the Iraq mission to the UN, and we're here because the US Marshals are turning the plates over to the Iraqi government. Um, what they told us in Creative Times offices was that they wanted this to coincide with Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki's visit to Washington. He was in DC yesterday meeting with President Obama. And uh, they're looking to bring the flat plates back home to Iraq on the same flight as the current Iraqi Prime Minister. I think the way that embassies and missions work is that you're technically on an Iraqi soil, uh, or you're on the soil of the country of the embassy, and so uh, we're on Iraqi soil. This is the first time my family's been back. <laughs> So they'll be returned to Iraq yes. tomorrow? Yeah, we don't, I'm not sure, but very soon. Okay. Very soon. Will it go in a museum? Or it should be. It should be, okay. yeah. What I heard was that the plates were a gift from the Queen of England. That's right. The Wedgwood China. So, and then the, uh, the more recent China, all different places, Limoges, Italy. Thank you so much, okay. and okay. good luck. Thank you. And Thank you. inshallah, Thank good time to head. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I had no idea. I honestly thought that we would be in some kind of office where people were getting passport visas or something else, and I never expected this level of uh, state presence. I mean, these these people walking in and out of the room, opening the door, shutting the door. It was like a striptease, and then... <laughs> so, um, so the, you know, more images, and then um, it turned out that, like I said, that the call had come from Obama, it was going back on the Iraqi PM's plane, and then on the front page of the New York Times um, on Thursday, December 15th, declaring the end of the Iraq war, is this little picture just below of the plates being contextualized as that handoff of power. So my parents were very proud. Um, so a project that was meant to kind of investigate, you know, the troubled triangle between the diner's tongue, the sweetness of the date syrup, which is usually a harbinger of good things to come. It's a very metaphoric uh, fruit. Um, and then the bitterness of the surface upon which it's presented, not just because of who it belonged to, but how it got to you um, through the overthrow of, um, of a leader by a foreign power um, was really sort of uh, embedded in the provenance. So there were many people who could not eat the meal, you know, who wanted to have the dish but had to refuse. So in, in, in as much as the project was about consumption, it was also about refusal. 
Best new thing in the world today is obviously the end of the Iraq war. Uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta saying today in Baghdad that Iraq is now fully responsible for directing its own path. The war ending, as it should, Iraq now becoming its own sovereign country without our flag flying over it anywhere, without our troops anywhere in it. That's easily the best new thing in the world, maybe this decade. But there's another Iraq story that is ending as it should. It doesn't beat the end of the war, but it's pretty good. Um, this fall, a Chicago-based artist got together with a New York City arts group and a restaurant. They put together an ambitious, big-thinking art project. They found on eBay dinner plates believed to have been looted from Saddam Hussein's palaces after the US invasion. They bought the plates, and as an interactive art installation, they served on Saddam's flatware and plates venison with tahini and date syrup and pomegranates. The project was called Spoils. The artist said he wanted diners to think about how the plates got to their table. Quote, this is about the symbols of power in that regime that have now come into the ownership of the populace that were living under Hussein, he told the New York Times last month. But you can't just buy Saddam's dinner plates on eBay, not legally anyway. When the art group was formally notified that the plates really belonged to the Iraqi people and needed to be returned, they agreed to give them up. So earlier this week, in what the New York Times described as a strange but cordial visit, the artist helped the US Marshals pack up the plates so they could be delivered to the Iraqi mission at the UN. By Tuesday afternoon, the plates had made their way to DC, where Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki was in town to meet with President Obama. The plates were then scheduled to fly back to Iraq with Maliki on his private plane on Wednesday, which is to say this ambitious, big-thinking art project ended as it should have. The Iraq war is over. Iraq is a sovereign nation. And one of the very small things that means is that they get their stuff back, too. Now it's time for the last word. Thank you. that there are still like moments of lightness. You know, the title of the lecture coming from Leonard Cohen's anthem, Ring the Bells That Still Can Ring, Forget Your Perfect Offering, There's a Crack in Everything. That's how the light gets in. So, you know, in some ways it's, um, it, it's just also appreciating the absurdity of certain situations and pointing to that. You know, that the, the date syrup is uh, this kind of veiled product, you know, that goes through all these different hoops, you know, to get from Baghdad to, to Lebanon so it can get sold in Sahadi imports in Brooklyn, you know, is kind of that absurdist um, motif that I'm interested in. 
But when it came to like the Iraq Museum, there's absolutely nothing to laugh about there. But then when I started to uh, research, it was one article in the New York Times called The Ghost in the Baghdad Museum um, that highlighted the fact that Donny George was somebody who evaded authority by doing something most directors don't do, and that he was actually a drummer in this like really awesome band, you know? And that in the midst of everything that I'm thinking about in terms of Iraq being torn to shreds, and never really being able to have access to the Iraq that my grandmother and my grandfather loved. Um, I thought about the fact that there was also a time where this guy wanted to be a musician and I wanted to be a musician at one point as well. And, um, and it became a very kind of human connection in some way. It, it really you know, focuses on the story of a person and not just the artifact at that point. But it's also okay for it to fixate on those details that are so idiosyncratic, but humanize the situation in it even more. So humor and human are, of course, related in their etymology. Um, but um, for me, it's a place that I feel like I can go to naturally without using it irresponsibly or using it simply as a joke. And that's the difference. I mean, humor has a kind of longevity, whereas jokes are are pretty, you know, um, uh, temporary in terms of their usefulness, I find. Does that answer your question? Yeah, or, yeah very yeah. much so. I mean, I love the connection to the human. And yeah. I think that's why I almost put this as to ask the question, because it is, it's really in the heart of the work. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm like I'm I'm like completely <laughs> subverting your authority here. <laughs> you and then we'll take you in the front. Yeah. I remember you were that we that uh, when you did the chat earlier, how I, how we talked about the your previous one of your other pieces, um, you're eating a dead language, and it's interesting that that yeah, with this piece you also included food. Like, how much has food become a part of your life? Like how, like how did it become a part of your life? Like did you work at a restaurant once or <laughs> did your family, or were you really close to your family when it came to cooking or? Yeah, I'm, I'm very close to my mother and um, was very close to my grandmother. I'm close to my father too, but he tends to just grill. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, when, when the first Iraq war happened, um, I was, uh, you know, politicized for the first time in my life at the age of 16. And, and it was a really, really disturbing moment because my grandmother told me all these beautiful stories about Baghdad growing up. And all of a sudden I felt like her stories were at risk um, as the drums beat towards war. And um, the first time I was introduced to Iraq in real time was through these images which are the CNN green-tinted night vision images of pieces of architecture that I'll never ever see being destroyed. And this was traumatic. And my mother, when she saw how traumatized I was looking at these images, turned to me and took my hand and said, you know, there's no Iraqi restaurants in New York. And it was like a riddle, you know, like uh, I tried to figure out what she meant. Like, did she mean that she wanted to stop working in my dad's medical office and open up a restaurant because she's an awesome cook? You know, but no, it was about the fact that Iraq was not visible or given any visible in the United States beyond uh, war and oil. And so this led to a project that dealt with me um, re in, not reinterpreting, but, you know, teaching her recipes to larger publics as a resistance against the war. So um, Enemy Kitchen was born. And so this is an ongoing project that I've been doing for the past 12 years, um, where my mother and I teach these recipes. And, uh, and this is great. This is the last day of the class where the mostly African-American Latino students who had uh, family that were, you know, serving in Iraq um, you know, after 10 weeks of teaching them about my food, they said, you don't know anything about ours, you know, uh, can we teach the last class? Which is kind of like my fantasy, it's always like I want the students to take over the university. Um, <laughs> I'm very sorry, but <laughs> I'm not up for a job. Uh, um, 
and uh, the, the students said, you know, do, do Iraqis make southern fried chicken? And I said, no, there's nothing like southern fried chicken in Iraq. And they said, well, we're going to invent Iraqi fried chicken. You know, so the, the final day, they, they marinated the, 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 the chicken in date syrup and baharat, the spice mix and everything else, and Iraqi fried chicken was born, you know, um, which then evolved into a food truck in Chicago where Iraqi refugees um, are the chief chefs of this uh, crazy food truck that roams the city streets. And that the sous chefs and the servers are Iraq veterans who served in Iraq. Um, so it inverts the power dynamic in, um, that normally happened in Iraq. And so the Americans are finally taking orders from the Iraqis. And uh, this is the Chicago flag rendered in Iraqi colors. And ends up doing this uncanny thing. And then the food is served on paper plate replicas of Saddam Hussein. <laughs> so, you know, that's where the antagonism and hospitality coexist. So, you know, food is, um, you know, I, I enjoy it like many other people do, but it, it also serves as a really amazing social equalizer to think about what the meal is. Um, and, um, and also, it's a slow process, especially Iraqi cooking. You know, it's pretty painstaking, and there are a lot of recipes that are starting to disappear from Iraqi modern cooking because they are so you know difficult to make unless you have time and hypercapitalism doesn't really allow for that time um, and so you know as people are cooking stuff gets set and what's beautiful here in this case is that you know when you make a kebab you take ground meat and you move it up and down a skewer by clenching your fist and so the veterans and the Iraqis started doing this thing where you'd have a veteran fist and then a refugee fist, and then a veteran fist, and a refugee fist. And so it's like this communion where you're taking in the negative space that's made in this gesture that would normally be affiliated towards aggression that's now being put to service as a constructive uh, gesture. So you know, that's kind of the nutshell reason. And if you're interested in the piece that she just mentioned, uh, Dar al Sol, you know, um, it was about uh, opening up the first Iraqi Jewish restaurant in the Arab world in over 80 years, which you'll have to do a Google search on. So, uh, does that answer your question? So, yeah. I think that I had already left this one, but it'll actually be our final question. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, if you still buy things on eBay. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Well, I mean, you know, I continue to um, to buy a lot of stuff from Iraq. The project in Dubai actually made use of, you know, breaking the vitrine, essentially, and using the plates that were smuggled out of Iraq by the Jews when they left in the 1950s and 60s. And so in Dubai, um, people were eating off of the former serving trays of the Great Synagogue of Baghdad as a way of leveraging um, Arab Jewishness as a way of speaking truth to power against Zionism and actually speaking in support of um, a memory that isn't so far away of how reintegration you know, could work if, if Palestine could exist. Um, and, uh, and so I've been buying a lot of these things constantly from antiquarians on eBay um, and collecting this kind of archive that I end up using whenever I do this project. Um, I also buy a lot of Beatles stuff. Um, I did a project about the Beatles in Palestine, you know, where they had planned their final concert actually for the Middle East and uh, for Palestinian radio in Ramallah. Um, I did a, I was commissioned to do a 10 episode program on the breakup of the Beatles as a kind of allegory for the breakup of uh, all hope in the Middle East. Um, and they actually share a timeline. Um, so I continue. It's an excuse also. I also buy guitars and my wife doesn't like that part. But, um, but you know, it's, it, like I said, I actually do use it as a search engine, you know, to find the things that are currently, you know, being spoken about. And unfortunately, with everything that's happened in Mosul in the last week and everything that continues to happen in the world, I'm scanning to see if anything is making its way as a kind of illegal item onto eBay yet again, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all.